maybe the point at you see somebody was uh, you were talking about flunking out and uh, most of the people who made the uh, biggest innovations in this field did in fact flunk out uh, well in fact none of them flunked out they all disappeared right <laughs> I don't, I don't, right I don't think at MIT I've ever heard of anyone flunking out and at least it, it, it happens but um, but the point is that it wasn't until 1970 that the professors could be said to know more than the students uh, in computer science. They had a kind of artificial view, and uh, I think this may be a real phenomenon. Uh, it certainly uh, is why uh, so many of these discoveries came from below, and uh, the image that Jack Dennis was head of RLE is a perfectly reasonable view from the bottom. <laughs> he was as high as you had to avoid. Right, because <laughs> uh, he's all the way up there at uh, assistant professor rank. Uh, I just, uh, everything anyone said brought dozens of images like going over to Heffron's and getting the right switches to play Even space. Eli's. Eli's. So Eli's is still there, but it's no use anymore because it only sells parts from computers. <laughs> <laughs> And the point, there was a great junkyard which uh, uh, had uh, every possible kind of surplus, but it had surplus you could use, because if you're doing anything with computers, you obviously don't want computer parts. <laughs> One of the ironies there. Uh, yes, there was a nice moment of banning space war, uh, many, just for a little while, of course, uh, many years later, some town of Braintree or somewhere banned arcade games, and I remember thinking, oh, they thought of that too. Well, <laughs> <laughs> with, with equal success. <laughs> right. It won't work. Uh, one of the uh, great mysteries to me of this whole period uh, was the disappearance of the graphic display. Deck started it pretty much. Uh, well, uh, I was just mentioning to McCarthy, it's really hard to believe the 704 was before the PDP-1, and I have this pretty well confused in my mind, but, well, of course, the 704 was a bigger, more powerful computer, but you couldn't program it much, and uh, uh, I don't think anybody's even mentioned Steve Russell's uh, role in the uh, programming of, of the uh, first versions of LISP. He played an immensely important, important role in that, uh, but that was mostly on the other computer, I remember when we got the PDP-6 one day, uh, when was that, about 66? When did the PDP-6 appear? 64. 64. Just a year or so after the PDP-1. Uh, anyway, it turned up and uh, I said, well, now we've got our own real computer. Uh, how are we going to do our AI research on it? There's no LISP. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the end of the next weekend there was. Well, actually, it's been going on for some time. It's Nobody been... told me. <laughs> uh, so a great deal of the success that uh, I'm credited with and John, John and I in the AI lab uh, came from the fact that uh, all this research was BP and uh, the same people who did these uh, Hacker exploits also did an immense amount of serious scientific work, uh, mostly by uh, figuring out what was going to be needed next year in AI. And uh, so when I said, let's have a lisp, and they said, well, it'll take at least three or four days. <laughs> uh, a few other things. Anyway, there was this decay of graphics. The PDP-1 had uh, this thing, and you could say plot XY, uh, the only other machine that I've been able to plot XY on is uh, some little Casio pocket computer which has a plot XY in its basic, but it's almost impossible to plot XY in uh, any real computer. And so it's, uh, in order to do graphics research, you have to get an awful lot of uh, equipment set up and go to an awful lot of trouble. Uh, later, I built one myself. Uh, I built a little computer for... Uh, working with uh, for children to be able to run logo programs. Unfortunately, it cost more than anybody thought, and schools couldn't afford it, but uh, it had a vector plotting scheme, and uh, that was great fun. I, then uh, shortly after that, I saw one in a little computer game named Vectrex, which I guess has 
bit the dust. As soon as, bit, as, soon as raster displays came out, uh, graphics went downhill and took maybe many years to recover. Oh, there are lots of other wonderful stories, but there are too many. Sh- it's getting too late. Yeah. <laughs> Professor McCarthy, would you like to uh, say a couple words here? John McCarthy. Well, I don't have very much um, to add to what has already been said. Uh, I would like to compare a little bit uh, the psychology of that time with the psychology of uh, computer use today. Uh, and uh, maybe I am guessing here because I don't really know too much about really either one. Um, but uh, consider that um, the PDP-1, as people <coughs> said, started with a 1K memory and went up to a 4K memory and then somewhat more. And uh, now people are talking, well, one megabyte is really rather small and... Uh, uh, Harvard gave me, uh, letting me use a machine with eight megabytes just as a terminal, and so forth. (laughs) Now, um, uh, I have not actually learned to write program um, 8,000 times as fast uh, as I um, uh, did uh, many years ago. In fact, I probably write somewhat slower than I did memory years ago, and while many years ago, and while people are somewhat faster, they aren't certainly 8,000 times as fast as the people um, many years ago. And uh, the result is, of course, that uh, people have to program at, so to speak, more like an executive level, uh, where uh, they don't really know what all these pieces that they are ordering around are. I mean, like the boss of a company who uh, doesn't um, fully understand what his henchmen are doing or thinking or going, but he gives them some orders and hopes that the right thing will happen. Well, now uh, it seems to me that a uh, programmer um, is a kind of uh, executive putting together these uh, parts. And um, what uh, is always amazing me is uh, people are saying, well, three megabytes is not really enough uh, you need more. And of course, the answer is if they really knew what was going on and were in a position to change it, um, even three megabytes for many of these things would be, um, uh, would be plenty. Well, uh, that I had something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was, so I think I'll stop. <laughs> uh, Richard Greenblatt, one of the canonical hackers uh, uh, from that period, uh, We'll say a couple things, then I will allow uh, time for maybe a, a couple questions from uh, you. Go. Well, I was really a latecomer to the PDP-1 scene. I, I arrived as an undergraduate and never was an official user or anything. But what, what I did was the sign-up list went up on Friday morning, uh, 8 o'clock, I think. And uh, within an hour, the entire week for the following week was signed up 24 hours a day, users coming in and signing up. So then I would come along and look at the sign-up list and see who was signed up and try to figure out who was usually late for their computer time. And I would then wait around, and the appointed hour would come along, and somebody would be a few minutes late showing up for their computer time. And I would jump on the machine and play around and and do my thing, and then maybe they wouldn't show up for their time at all, or maybe they would come in 15 minutes late or something. And That was computer access in those days. Um... Later, uh, I was uh, uh, involved in in a number of these uh, things that have been alluded to. I don't have too much to add to the the good stories, though, that have been uh, related about it. So I think I'll just go on. Okay. Uh, sale system at Stanford, um, will, uh, which is a 
was originally a PDP-6 and went through various uh, versions of PDP-10 and is a KL-10 and is, of course, thoroughly obsolete, but nevertheless still working, at least the new service uh, works uh, and so forth, uh, will, if it lasts, uh, be turned off on June 8th of next year, which will be its uh, 25th anniversary. And I've been thinking about how it should celebrate its uh, demise, and um, it should um, um, uh, send people a message, I think. So if um, anyone wants to be sent um, the final message of the... Uh, of the sale computer uh, just before it's turned off, uh, then you should um, communicate. Uh, but now, um, having sort of thought of that from an administrative point of view, um, it's inst not instantly clear to me as to where you should send this um, uh, email. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Well, my poor secretary. I'll make her do it. Um, <laughs> so, if you want to be sent email when um, uh, when sale is turned off, uh, send um, email to MPS, M as in Mary, P as in Pat, S as in Simmons, um, at uh, cs.stanford.edu, and you'll get the final message of the uh, PDP-10. Uh, provided it doesn't crash irrevocably in the meantime, because if it crashes in the meantime, it's sort of uh, been agreed that uh, uh, no heroic measures will be <laughs> will be undertaken. It is asked for that. It has this living will. <laughs> okay, uh, one one more uh, uh, person to say a word. Uh, uh, Ted Johnson, uh, I'd like to call up here. Uh, maybe he could tell us about uh, something about selling the machine because uh, uh, as Dex, uh, VP of sales uh, for 20-some uh, years, uh, he probably had to uh, convince people to pay uh, you know, this very reasonable sum for a PDP-1. Well, I hope I don't c contaminate this hacker's delight by throwing in a commercial dimension. But uh, I think I can add a few facts here in a different perspective. As facts? Ed, as Ed Fredkin pointed out... Uh, uh, before the PDP-1, Digital was entirely a, a modules company, and uh, you're looking at the sales force at the time that the PDP-1 was invented. Was, uh, I was the only person in the field. We had no field, uh, only person in sales, officially, that is. Everybody was really selling, but I was the only sales engineer, and uh, we had no field offices. I was in Maynard. Uh, one exception to the module business is that uh, we also sold memory testers, and even though I was the only sales person and I was selling modules, they took me out of the field for about uh, two weeks to design the first memory tester with the logic. When they, after talking with RCA, the, the company decided to build their own system. Now, I didn't really realize they were laying the groundwork for being into the computer business at all. I mean, our total focus was the module business. And I really didn't know all the cards that Ken was planning, was planning to play, although I had... Uh, seen the business plan originally, I probably should have known better. <laughs> but we were really focused. Anyway, in April of uh, 59, I happened to be in the office with Ken and Harlan Anderson when a re request for a quotation came in. We opened it up. It was from the U U.S. Uh, Naval Ordnance Test Station in Pasadena. And it was a request for a 36-bit uh, a machine, five megacycles, fit, fit the uh, module line perfectly. And uh, Ken turned to me and he said, this is just what I wanted to build. Go sell us a computer. What's a computer? <laughs> Didn't really know. Um, so after thinking about it they, they, uh, and talking to Ben Gurley, who joined in June, uh, the decision was made that, well, if we're going into the computer business, the 36-bit machine is going to take a while not only to build but also to close the sale with the Navy. Why don't we start small and build an 18-bit machine? And, oh, by the way, we should probably build one in the middle someplace. I've never known whether that was supposed to be 24 or 27 bits. But that's the reason why there was a gap. There was the PDP-1, the PDP-2, and the PDP-3. And uh, I believe the PDP-3 actually was built, by the way. 
uh, we had a light of 10 megacycle modules, and many, many years later, I was shown that machine. It's over in, in Waltham someplace in, in a basement by some drug company. The customer put it together. Right. They we, ordered one and they declined to build it. Actually, two were ordered. AFCRL ordered one. They were delivered two PDP-1s with some explanation that that made <laughs> <laughs> uh, And um, the other one was a company, I think it was an architectural firm, and they really wanted it, so they said, do you have any pieces of paper with any kind of design? They took the design, bought the modules, and built a machine and made it work. So, <laughs> uh, after you surplus it, and Mike Dealer programmed uh, all sorts of yeah. all sorts of wonderful things on yeah. it. That scope had a really interesting career at MIT. It first yeah. came to the AI lab, and then it went to RLE. It went to about four different research laboratories. Each stopped about a year and a half or two years. It made all kinds of pretty pictures of each laboratory. I had a great and program called so Wire. Go to the next lab. <laughs> wonderful fireworks. And that was a very good program because we never got the colors to converge. But in uh -huh. the case of wire, it's working as a conversion. You can't fix the yeah. hardware, fix the program. <laughs> getting back to the commercial side. So. Um, ben Gurley joined in June and began designing and laying out the PDP-1. And we introduced the working machine in November. So uh, that was a tremendous time to market issue, and from our perspective, uh, selling modules is just a testimony to what, what you could really do with using our standard modules. The one competitor that we had in the first year that I recall was CDC, the 160A. I have a slightly interesting story there, too. I think most of you might know that digital and CDC started off the same month, same year, September 1957, both going off in the scientific engineering area, but totally different uh, strategies. And uh, I was, in my module selling, was very, uh, um, it was difficult to find a customer for, for modules in those days. And uh, I remember calling up CDC at one point and, try, and visiting them in Minnesota and trying to sell them on converting and using our modules to build their, build their computer. Of course, they were much too far along. It was a silly idea, but I was naive and an eager, eager salesperson. Um, I did see in the side when they were building the 1604, what was the first? Yeah. 1604. And the 160A was the machine, the prototype, or the test machine that they built. And it was sort of a sideline for them to go out and try to sell this machine. I think they were the first ones to ever, however, make a deal, an OEM contract for, for small machines. From then on, uh, the brass largely focused on the real selling of PDV-1s for a couple of years. And the sales force, now I was in the West Coast, continued to largely focus on, uh, on selling modules. We did sell, there were 49, I believe, BP-1 sold. 16 of those were sold to ITT, uh, who used them for message switching, communications applications. And Nick Mazaris was brought in, brought in to be the, uh, the account manager for ITT. That was really the start of the computer OEM business. And, of course, later on in 1965, when we went to the product line organization, Nick was put in charge of all the, uh, the small computers. Well, I think that's just some added perspectives. Thank you. I'd just like to um, make a comment. When DEC got started, the one ground rule they had was no software. That was for other people. You want this machine, you guys write the software. And uh, about selling the computers, I remember that one day we had a PDP-1 at BBN, and Harlan Anderson, who was sort of like a partner with uh, Ken Olson as running the company, called me and said, would I go with him on a sales call for a PDP-1? And I said, sure. So we went off to Ohio State University and talked up the PDP-1, and it was clear that they weren't going to give an order right then and there. As we were coming back on the plane, Harlan Anderson grumbled to me and said, that's the last time we'll ever do that. And I said, that's the last time you'll ever do what? He says, call on someone to try and sell them a computer. If someone wants one of these machines, they've got to come here and buy it. And that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Before I throw it uh, open for some questions, I, I actually have a question. There was one um, uh, story which I determined at least 
uh, to be at least partially apocryphal. It concerned um, a little wire that some of uh, the hackers maybe here hooked up between the TX0 and the PDP1 and played a, uh, wanted to play a prank on the professors. The way the story usually goes is the professors are Professors Minsky and McCarthy to say, we have hooked up this computer, rigged the computer, given it software to play chess. And, uh, you know, one was in one room, the other was in the other room, and uh, they were actually playing against each other, thinking they were playing against the computer until one of them, I think as the story goes, uh, McCarthy noticed that the uh, moves were being really put on one letter at a time as a person would type it and walked in the other room and, and discovered it. And I, I think I, I had eliminated uh, Marvin Minsky from, from, from the story maybe when I asked him about it. I think Tinker was... No, hmm. Shannon, I'm sorry. Johnny, you, you, you see, any, any name in computing winds up in one of those rooms. But, uh, <laughs> Professor Carly, do you remember, you remember that at all? If you ask any yeah, one, well, it's the um, The part about me is correct. Okay, that, that, that's the way I had it in the book. I, so. I, I conjecture that I was playing against some human, but it just seems to me I, I wasn't actually told against whom I was playing. <laughs> so I just assumed that it was one of the hackers. <laughs> was that true or not? Well, the, the, actually, the way I actually attributed the story to, to Samson, the way he, he told it after I uh, eliminated Minsky, that, the, you know, that he insisted the idea was that you know you're playing against the computer here, and you know, uh, uh, and you know, and, and not a, another human, but you know. Uh, that's, you know... Yes, it was certainly built that way. Okay. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, you were suspicious. <laughs> were there uh, other, uh, you know... Uh, well, I once was fooling Tigger this way. I think it was Tigger. Oh. ATSS. And uh, he was asking questions in English, and somebody had claimed we had an English answerer. <laughs> so then he asked what was... Uh, he typed in two eight-digit numbers and asked what the product of that was. And... <laughs> Thinking fast, I typed out accumulator overflow. <laughs> <laughs> he noticed that it was being typed one letter at a time. It may be that there was not just one of these. Hmm, that could be. <laughs> uh, do we have any uh, questions from uh, out here for any of our panelists? Just, uh, Steve, tell me. Why wasn't the uh, torpedoes in uh, space war never affected by gravity? Uh, because it took too much time to calculate gravity for the torpedoes. <laughs> uh, an example of an important principle of PDP-1 programming, which was the dominating principle of PDP-8 programming, and that is you compromise the problem until it fits on the machine you've got. <laughs> That's the Dave All book, isn't it? Uh, basic computer games. I used the most sophisticated uh, language available at the time I started, which was macro. Space War was written <coughs> in a language that you will find in this particular book. There are two separate listings of Space War, the original final version and a version that was uh, developed at MIT over the ensuing summer months and that came out in September. But if you want to see what uh, the kind of uh, programming that we did, uh, you're welcome to have a look at this afterwards. I'll uh, open it to a few pages and you'll get a, <coughs> some idea of uh, what went through our minds. I I would like to point out with some unjustified pride that uh, I was quizzed by the lawyers a year or so ago about what some of the, or not the lawyers, but one of the consultants they had on one of the patent cases on what Space War did, and I had commented it just barely well enough so that I could look at what was puzzling them and say, oh yes, that does, and explain it correctly. <laughs> Uh, it's all his fault. The guy with the yellow shirt. The guy with the yellow shirt, he did it. He's the last guy to design the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the guy with the yellow shirt now? Dan Murphy. All right, I, I, I plead guilty. <laughs> Pico was, was cooked up on the very same PDP-1 that uh, we 
we've all been talking about on the second floor of Building 26. Um, and Tico, for, for the benefit of those who might not know, Tico was... Is a, is a text editing program, um, one of the early ones that you could use interactively. And it had a couple of things that, that were kind of advances over what seemed to be kicking around at the time. Um, when I first arrived at the PEP-1, there was a, a program on it called Expensive Typewriter, which you could, in fact, use to change your program using the computer to punch a new paper tape. Um, it had two problems. One, you had to use it on the computer. And secondly, you could only change a whole line of your program at a time. So if just one letter was wrong, you had to retype the whole thing. And my motivation for writing Kiko was to change both of those aspects, to let you be able to change one character at a time, but also to say what changes you wanted to make offline using the flexor writers that were in the next room, such that when you got your precious little shot of machine time, you could go there, take your program, take the changes, and have a new tape punched out, all, all in very short order. Now, it turns out, of course, that Tico was almost never used in that mode. We very quickly added a switch where you could enter the commands while you were on the computer, and of course, that's what everybody then, then did with it for uh, all the years later that it was used. If, if I might, I want to tell one other story about Tico, ever since your, your, your book came out, I always wanted to point out that some of the hackers in MIT in that uh, era, uh, not all of them came from the Model Railroad Club. There were a few of us who came from the MIT radio station. And I think this is significant because one's background tended to have some influence on the reasons that one conducts certain hacks. And uh, with Tico, I had, I had a version of it that did just the very basic kinds of editing things, replacing characters and finding stuff and so forth. And the next level of improvements to it came about this way. At the radio station, we had a guy who had an interesting talent. And this story is a little embarrassing, but here's what it was. He was able to uh, read copy, like news reports and so forth, in a simulated Chinese accent by virtue of merely exchanging all the L's and R's in the text. And you could do this in real time, like saying digital, uh, digiter, histoly, uh, rectal series, like that. And you could read this at full speed. So sitting in the Yihong Gui's one night, we decided it would be really nice if a computer could change all the L's and R's in piece of text so that anybody could read in this pseudo Chinese text. Well, all we need is a loop so that you go through and you look for the L's and you change it to something else and so forth. And from that came the loop capabilities, the conditional capabilities, and several other things in Tico that turned out to make it so, so we all owe search and replace in our word processors to uh, that hack. Is that it? <laughs> well, in fact, I did most of my programming in the '60s in Tico, and uh, I still have uh, this little bit of code, which I think is the shortest uh, description of a universal Turing machine ever written. It's got four little lines of Tico, but the last time I tried it, it didn't work. I wonder if you have a. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that out loud. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know Tico, uh, you should understand that those who do have some form of love-hate relationship with it. Uh, it. It is very powerful, and we've all used it to do something that we couldn't do any other way. But it's also powerfully mysterious when you start trying to do things that are complicated. And we've all been done in by it more times than we can remember. It's good because it makes APL look so simple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. the, uh, by the way, I, I consider, I don't know what the ultimate Tico hack is, but I consider the macro written by Gosper that found the first glider gun 
by searching through every kind of configuration for That's the right. game of life. This was discovered by a Tico macro. So, uh, no, I never knew yes, that. right. Well, for, for many years, the deck, Tico was an important CAD tool, too. So uh, we couldn't well, have done that PDP-10 without it. And vital to, vital to, to digital engineering data processing because Dick Best's list was, on t was maintained in Tico. Dick oh, Best. yes. Dick Best. Okay, there's a question back there. Many <laughs> um, years ago, at Adidas, I think they were celebrating the 10th anniversary of PC 11. There was a big trivia contest that was given. One of the questions uh, that was asked was, what does TICO stand for? And the two possible answers that came up with was either a text editor and printer or tape editor and printer, because what is like tape for tape? For many years, I've been trying to understand what the real answer is. So I'm waiting to get a hope. Well, I do get asked that question occasionally. Um, in fact, it was tape because it was the only thing you could do in a PDP one was take the paper tape and add and punch out a new one. And so, the t in fact, the T for tape wound up in several things. In Flint, as, as I heard a few minutes ago, DDP, which was tech debugging tape. Tech debugging tape. All right. When DEC took over some of these things, they changed the T to mean other things. But it was very good. Not right. Digital debugging techniques and so forth. But uh, it was originally tape for everything. <coughs> I guess we should also pay homage to another family of uh, PDP-1 programs. We mentioned expensive typewriter. There was also expensive desk calculator and expensive planetarium. And at Stanford, when we had a PDP-1, we also briefly had expensive tape recorder and expensive mirror. <laughs> uh, the idea was these things did the functions that... Uh, said, but they did them using $120,000 worth of equipment, which made them spectacularly more expensive <laughs> than using the real item. What did expensive mirror do? Uh, it was a program that uh, read the TV camera with excruciating slowness and displayed it on the uh, CRT. <coughs> <laughs> okay. First? All right. <laughs> Smart. No, I, I don't think we paid attention to that. Smart. <laughs> yes, smart. Small, smart, meaning small matter of programming. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, there, okay. There was there one more question out there. Okay. I was just going to mention that there was another interesting piece of equipment that, uh, on the PDP one that I, I worked on at the Institute of Computing Science and other PDP one at MIT, which is the lab for nuclear science. Um, which was an interesting one. That was about a 58K machine. And, and uh, Huge. Deck, Deck had figured out quite how you, all the problems with shipping things. What they did for adding more memory was bolt them on in an expander cabinet on the back. And, and of course, you bolted the cabinet on, then you wired across the cabinet frame. When it got to 20 feet with a you know, long, this is 58K of core, um, it couldn't fit in the elevator, so they actually had to hoist it up and in through a window in order to deliver it. So the problem was selling it. But it was a piece of equipment on it, the IBM typewriter. That, uh, uh, the Soroban Sorab Computyper. Well, we had, an, we, had, we had an upgrade. We had an IBM small uh, uh, typewriter. Oh, wow. 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 It's not an interesting characteristic. Uh, the program we had, we needed to call the operator to input things who were going um, tape sc uh, film scanning for high energy physics, and the operators would be gone out of the room. So what they would do to call them when the uh, when they needed input was they would get a little, they would type out a message saying please input, wait a bit. And if nothing happened, it would switch the, uh, the the ribbon from from black to red and then back again. That was a command you could give it. So go. And if something happened after a few seconds of doing that, the operator didn't arrive, it would then shift the whole the whole uh, keyboard, which is the, the um, upper and lower case, which in the old typer is not the ball one, but the one with the keys, which is what we used. Um, that whole carriage would go clunk, clunk, clunk. So you walked down the hall and heard this typewriter. <laughs> that was our signal for the operator. <laughs> <laughs> I, that reminds me, one of the things that we didn't mention about PDP-1, 
uh, which I was noticing on the one over in the other building, was that they all came with a piece of do-it-yourself I.O. in them. And so one of the things that you could do merely by purchasing a few extra modules was cause whatever you had in the room to uh, get connected to the computer. And um, almost everybody used that for getting space war con controls in. But it was also done for a lot of lab equipment. And uh, nothing else beforehand. No, nobody else had ever even thought of telling you how to connect, get your switches into the computer or whatever, or get your signals out. It was just you put, plugged it into the official printer, and that was all you needed to do. Right. When, when the first production PDP-1 was delivered to BBN, um, it um, had this kind of uh, I.O. capability, and uh, we knew we had this scheduled event, and Ken Olson was there and all kinds of important people, and there was this big red ribbon. We had a ribbon-cutting ceremony, except the computer uh, turned actually uh, did something that pulled a paper cutter down and it chopped its own ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, to me, the greatest thing about the PDP-1 was the fact that uh, when you had an idea, this was the first time in sort of the history of the world, and this idea involved either programming or uh, hardware ideas like that, you could implement them in a few days. And all kinds of very important things that used to be projects that took forever, just a bunch of guys would go and make something happen that illustrated that it could be done, and they'd do it in, you know, by staying up a few nights in a row and get it done in a few days. It was just fantastic. Yeah, I want to mention something else that uh, perhaps I should have mentioned uh, before. And uh, that was the, the PDP-1 was a machine which had a five microsecond cycle. Uh, and yet it managed to use it. It was possible to build time sharing systems on it that uh, served a fair number of users. Uh, mm -hmm better than many systems do today <laughs> uh, in terms of promptness. And yes. uh, the swapping drum, uh, of course, was the key to it, in that in one drum revolution, uh, which was 30 milliseconds. And no latency. Uh, right. Without latency, that was right. another piece of Ed's elegance. Uh, uh, it could uh, swap one 4K user out and another 4K uh, uh, user in. And um, so uh, when we had it at Stanford, it could really give reasonable service on this very slow machine uh, to 12 users. And uh, I remember when we started uh, uh, the lots... Uh, the low overhead time sharing at Stanford, which was in 75, and we used uh, DEC-20. Uh, then um, I had made calculations back in the early days which said that, sure, a PDP-1 ought to be able to handle quite a lot of users if all they're doing is editing, because here's how long it takes for an interrupt, and here's how long it takes to put the character in the buffer. <coughs> and uh, then the question arose, well, why do we... Why is it that one deck 20 is not enough uh, to handle these students? Why is it so slow? And I put a guy to working on it, and um, he found out that uh, if you were using the ancient editor, uh, then that uh, was written at Stanford a long time ago, then a typical editor user used one 250th of the machine of this um, uh, deck 20. Uh, which wasn't, which it was pretty bad from the point of view of what ought to have been possible, uh, but was plenty good from the point of view of our requirements. However, if he was using Emacs, he was <laughs> using one seventieth of the machine, uh, which made him an average user. So um, uh, that is, we were trying to, su to serve seventy people on the machine. So one of the other consequences of this enormous increase in memory is that nobody knows today where the computer time is going. Well, it goes into all, running all that code that fits in all the extra memory. <laughs> all right. Um, I have a question. Okay. Well, maybe we'll just take that one because we're getting a little short of time and uh, this will finish it off. There's great hackers here. And uh, 
and, and we've got these machines with all this memory. So how many virtual PDP-1s are there? If you guys love using PDP-1s, there are color scopes, there are black and white scopes, they're not vector scopes. But, you know, are there lots of emulators running around for, for this, this ultimate and great machine? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think anyone claimed it was ultimately great for now. It seemed great at the time. For that. <laughs> and uh, many of the things were, well, uh, it was a paper tape machine. And at Stanford, the first time sharing system we built there, we faithfully simulated paper tape on the drum. And uh, it concluded, we. Then so tried to make the drum go backwards. Yeah. Well, we then tried to teach undergraduates. <laughs> we then tried to use it for some undergraduate courses, and discovered that paper tape was pretty hard to explain, pretty cumbersome to explain. It was a 46-step process to get your program assembled when you wrote it all down, and when you faithfully simulated it, the fact that you didn't have physical tape didn't make it a bit easier to understand at all. And um, it was really nice to have a. It really is nice to have a proper file system. Okay. On, on that note, I think uh, let's uh, thank our panel and our guests for a terrific afternoon. And thank the PDP One for uh, kicking off the year of interactive computing. <laughs>